As you can see, I cannot almost talk, so I won't. <laughs> uh, but I would like to thank you, um, to say you that we are really pleased that you are here today. Welcome to our speakers, and uh, wish you that you have interesting information today. Thank you. Hello, okay, well, we'll start this now. How we're going to do it is we're all going to speak for about five or ten minutes, and then later we'll open the floor up to questions and we'll try and get to as, spend as much time on questions as we can. So I'll start first. My name is Catherine Bonici, and I've been working in distribution for over ten years now. At the moment, I work for Java Films, and we do production, distribution, pre-sales. But what's been interesting for me is that in the past 10 years, distribution has changed completely. When I first started working, there was just one model of doing things. And my job basically consisted of finding the films that corresponded with the slots of my clients and then selling those films to my clients. And the only way of reaching an audience was by going through the channels. And that meant that there were a lot of really good films that just had no chance of reaching an audience because they were the wrong duration or they were slightly the wrong subject. And in the last couple of years, with all the new platforms that have opened up, like VOD, like crowdfunding, it's now much more easy for directors to speak to the audience directly. The problem is that with these new channels have come a lot of confusion. And we've been very involved with the new models with the productions that we've been involved with, but also just watching to see what's happened. And we've tried to try out a few. And my own personal experience is that these new platforms are great if you know what you're doing, if you have a plan, if you're focused. But you have to be really realistic about what you want. And you also have to have the right project for the right platform. What works best in my personal experience are films that have a message that is speaking to an audience that's already there. For example, there was a great film called The World According to Monsanto, um, and the director managed to raise over 100,000 euros to finance this film by pre-selling the, doc the documentary before it was made. But that was because Monsanto was already a very well-known company. There was already a large lobby against it. People were already interested in it. Uh, on the flip side of that, earlier this year, we were involved with a crowdfunding project for a series of three to five minute science documentaries. And that had a very great realistic plan. It had a plan of rewards depending on how much you're going to donate. Um, it went to lots of festivals, got a lot of interest, and the director hoped to raise 60,000 euros from crowdfunding. We all thought that this was a very realistic proposal considering the, the uh, production team's experience. But in the end of the day, most people weren't interested in funding these films because they were just short films about science. They were the kind of films people associated with school, with education. There wasn't really a strong message, a social message behind them. So instead of raising 60,000 euros, we ended up raising 15,000. And that's still good, but at the same time, it didn't do what we hoped because we weren't talking to the right audience. If it had, I personally believe that if those films had been about trying to do social change or had been about controversial companies, it would have been a lot easier to raise the money. When I first started out with crowdfunding and with new platforms, one of the first projects I worked on was a film called McLibel that you may have heard of because it was over 10 years in production and it ended up going on BBC Storyville on lots of big slots and it was about this couple that took on McDonald's and what was interesting about that project is when we started with it no broadcaster would touch it because it was far too controversial to make an anti-McDonald's film and so we went online and we built a really good website for it and a Facebook page and we got people talking about it and we got more and more hits and more and more people started contacting us. And in the end, this film became so big that it was impossible for the broadcasters to ignore. 
but the broadcast sales happened years down the line. And that was because of the topic. Now, the other thing to bear in mind is that VOD platforms are a great way for talking to the audience directly, but they don't fund the film. At the moment, the main way of funding the films are still commissions, film funds, and possibly online funding, but mainly commissions. And more and more nowadays, broadcasters are asking for VOD rights, and VOD is impacting on the sales that we make. So that's just one more thing you have to bear in mind. I think what most people need to do is you need to draw up a very clear strategy of what audience you want to reach, why you think your audience will be interested in your film, and what the best way to reach your film is. And the best way of reaching audiences is still, at the moment, going through conventional channels. It's just that with all these new platforms, there is another way of doing it. Now, I'm going to pass you over to Mori, who is an independent consultant. You've all got his biog in your pack. Thank you. <laughs> you can tell I'm media challenged. I'm a very old school guy. Um, so I'm going to begin with a quick story, and the story is about uh, an explorer who went deep into the Amazon forest and found a tribe that uh, no, one had, no one had discovered before. And this tribe lived so deeply in the forest that they could barely see the sky. And because they were surrounded by trees, they were used to seeing everything very close up because there was nothing in the distance from them. Uh, so at one point, uh, the explorer said, you know, it's come time for me to leave. Uh, and he was talking to the, the head of the tribe, and he said, would you like to come with me to my world? So the chief of the tribe said, yes, I will go with you to your world. I want to see your world. So they put on their backpacks, and they hiked for a couple of months till they came to the edge of the forest. And as they came to the edge of the forest and they walked away from the forest, suddenly there was in front of them a large plain. And at the edge of the plain, there was something that the tribesmen had never seen before, and that was a horizon line. And at the edge of the horizon, uh, there was a water buffalo way out into the distance. So the, uh, the, tribe, the chief of the tribe turned to the explorer and said, please, my friend, tell me, what is the name of that ant over there? And the uh, explorer uh, looked at the, uh, the chief and said, well, chief, I don't know how to tell you this, but that's, we call that a water buffalo. And it's not an ant. It's a very large animal. So the chief uh, thought for a second, and then he, he laughed. And he turned to the explorer and said, thank you for that joke. Now please tell me the name of that ant over there. <laughs> Um, so I, I felt a little bit like that explorer as I've, I've come here to, uh, to CJIS and when I was in Canada recently and, and in Micronesia talking about a way of looking at film and video that's very foreign uh, to what many foreign producers are used to. And it's a little bit like walking out of the forest into a completely different environment uh, and knowing that what you think is an ant is really a water buffalo. So, Here's some stuff that I've been thinking about a lot lately that I hope will co cohere. Um, what I'm beginning to see is that the new channel, and I want to talk about the future. We're kind of at the edge of the future and where that horizon is going. The new channels are not going to be the old channels. And we can't know now what they're going to look like. But we do know what's driving them. And one of the things that's driving them, of course, is the economy, the changing economy. The other big driver is new social media and social networking. And the fact that social media and social networking has its own complex of rules around it, possibilities and something that I call imperatives. So when you enter the world of crowdfunding, for instance, it has a set of imperatives if you want to be successful with it. Uh, and there's the democratization of the art form, the integration of media in everything we do. It just cuts across everything we do now. You pick up your phone, you've got your iPod, it's integrated into your uh, refrigerator. The loosening and the stranglehold 
uh, the loosening of the stranglehold and the power of gatekeepers. So that's changing dramatically. The people who decide how things will be shown and the ability to circumvent and go around them. So while I was thinking about these the last week, as I was read reading, I came across a couple of quotes that I thought I have to bring these with me because they speak to what I've been thinking about. So here's the first quote, and it's from Nilo for a merchant of a Rubicon Consulting, a CEO and corporate director. The quote is, and so the question is, how do you build systems of people you're not pre-selecting, and then figuring out where does the compensation flow happen? Right? It's not necessarily a direct exchange. I make this thing, you buy this thing, or you do this thing, and I pay you. How you create value and how you get compensated are going to inherently come from different places. That's first quote. The second quote is, and this was my crowdfunding quote of the week, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday, is from Max Salzberg, who did a, a really big uh, campaign to create this new diaspora program. So he said, we thought this would be a summer project, Mr. Salzberg said. We wanted to make it because it was something we believed in, but we got roped in maintaining a relationship with a lot of people. We weren't prepared to have to deal with that. And my last quote is from uh, Ted Hope, who just became the executive director of San Francisco International uh, Film Festival in San Francisco, writes a column for um, IndieWire, somebody I respect a lot. He has a great blog you should call, I think it's called Hope for Film, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so here's uh, what uh, he had to say. Film is no longer a viable career choice for new artists or those who want to facilitate them. Instead, everyone must now seek out secondary support occupations to pursue their passions or be blessed by birth or patrons. The strategically wise among them have already embraced a shift from individualized creative expressions to more collaborative ventures. Long-range planning and infrastructure building need as much, perhaps more, attention than the commitment to the individual visionary work. Now, I'm a strategic planner, so I find that really interesting. And the shift from a product business model to that of a relationship with the people formerly known as the audience. I remember I said yesterday I don't use the word audience anymore. It's really community. Uh, so the shift from a product business model to that of a relationship with the people formerly known as the audience is a huge transition that won't be easy. So this is the stuff that's really been bothering me and that I'm spending a lot of time thinking about lately when I deal with my clients. So the, the major pragmatic implication for filmmakers and fundraising distribution is this shift from audience to community. And with that comes a whole new set of roles, responsibilities, and opportunities. It's a two-edged sword. And the new sources of funding and distribution, I think, are going to come from these interactions. And they're ones that we can't predict. We don't know what's going to happen. So yesterday, for instance, I told you one story about uh, my daughter and her Kickstarter campaign. I'll tell you one other story about this kind of ripple effect of throwing the dice and seeing what happens. Um, to do the Kickstarter campaign, she decided that she needed to have a couple of heavy hitters, big names with her. And it turns out that uh, a couple of years ago, she was on the set of Lost. You know the television program Lost? Well, they hired her in Hawaii to work on Lost because she knows a lot about doing on water stuff. And during the shooting, she became friends with one of the actors. So before the Kickstarter campaign, she goes to the actor and said, will you uh, do a promo for me and be, and be a co-producer of the Kickstarter campaign? And he said, yes, but you know, I don't have a lot of money right now, but what I could do is I have a publicist I use in Hollywood. And I'll give you... Uh, 40 hours of her time, right? So my daughter starts working with the publicist and the publicist says, well, you know, one of the first things you should do before you kick off the Kickstarter campaign is you need to set up this promo marketing uh, work where, where you get covered by blogs and could you do some lectures and personal appearances in and around Seattle where you live? So my daughter contacted uh, Washington, the University of Washington and a person who teaches a class there and this woman said, yes, come to my, I want you to meet my class, we'll have the press there that day, and you can do a presentation in the middle of your campaign. So one of 
the, the morals here is that old school, new school is also old school. So when you're doing something like Kickstarter, which seems like very new school, you need to do old school, hands-on, flesh-to-flesh stuff at the same time. Well, I'm getting to the point of the story and then I quit, I promise. So, <laughs> uh, okay, so she goes to the University of Washington and uh, you know, a whole lot of students show up and she gives a lecture and does answers and questions and answers about her project in Rwanda. And at the end of the presentation, one of the students comes up to her and says, I want to help you. Now, I don't have a lot of money, but I'm going to make a $10 donation, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to my dormitory, and my dormitory is going to pledge to you. They're going to get behind your project. We're going to vouchsafe your project. So he goes back to his dormitory, and now she's got 100 students who are each giving $10 to her project. So this is the kind of ripple thing that I think the new filmmaker has to be ready for, so that... The, you want to do things that are more likely to help you succeed than not. And, I, and for me, that's something I call to encourage serendipity. I call it to curry serendipity. Um, so that's all I've got to say right now. That's my 10 minutes. Thank you very much. And now we'll hand over to Charlie from the Sheffield Doc Fest. Cool. Um, can we, there we go, the screen's up there. Um, that was a really good lead in to um, some stuff that I want to talk about for the next five or so minutes. Um, I always like to have visual material to accompany me, um, so it's not a PowerPoint presentation, it's just a kind of comfort blanket for me, um, especially because I'm staring at the wall, which feels very, very weird, but anyway. Um, so I, um, I run the meat market um, at Sheffield Dockfest, which, if you don't know, is a big documentary event in the UK. Uh, and as part of running the meat market, I bring together um, lots of funders, lots of distributors, uh, lots of filmmakers, and theoretically, lots of deals get done. And that's all wonderful and amazing. Um, and it does work. Um, but it's such a small proportion um, of the number of documentaries that are getting made at the moment that actually get served in Sheffield and get served in places like this. And, and that's, that's a very troubling thing for me because I know how many people are making docs at the moment. But more than that, I know that there's a massive demand from audiences for documentary content. And I don't think we want to be in a place where because there aren't enough commissioning slots to be able to serve the documentaries that people want to see, and there aren't enough slots in the cinema, and you know, there, there aren't generally enough opportunities out there in the traditional system, I don't want to be in a place where documentary makers give up, or where audiences aren't getting to see documentaries, because that's kind of the place where we are at the moment, that there's a, there's a gap between the stuff that should be getting made and the demand from audiences. So that's the kind of context that um, I'm operating in. Um, I'm mainly going to talk about crowdfunding, because uh, that's a big passion of mine. Uh, probably, people have been talking about crowdfunding for the last couple of years, so you probably know what it is. It's uh, getting money from a big group of people rather than from a single commissioning editor or a single uh, film funder. Uh, for me, crowdfunding is a very powerful philosophical thing because it uh, represents the growing interactivity, um, as Mori was talking about, between producers and consumers. Uh, it represents what audiences want. They want to feel involved in the production of films. Uh, so I think, it, as well as being a practical way for people to get funding for their films, I think that philosophically it's something but very powerful. So um, we're still relatively in relatively early days for it, but I'm, I'm a very strong advocate for it. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of advertising here. Um, this is um, our crowdfunding campaign that we're running at the moment. Um, I'm not just going to talk about this, uh, but um, this shows that we're putting our our, or your money where our mouth is, we like to say. Um, and we're, we're trying to raise funding uh, for the 2013 Sheffield Doc Fest. Uh, we're hoping to raise uh, $25,000, and that's where we are at the moment. Uh, and our, our experience of, doing, of, of wanting to do this, I think, mirrors why a filmmaker might want to crowdfund. Uh, we're facing declining public investment in festivals in the UK, similar to filmmakers facing declining public investment in their films. Um, and that's a shame. And that means that you need to fill the gap for the funding. And 
potentially have the option of going to brands and to corporate funders or to individual philanthropists. And that is a possible source of funding, but there are ethical issues that come with that. And when you do have a community around you, which we do as a festival, but also lots of filmmakers like Franny Armstrong do, this can be a viable option for, um, for raising finance in something that is far more ethically neutral than both public and private financing. So it, this, is, this is something we really believe in and that's why we're doing it. Uh, and in case you've not seen what a crowdfunding campaign looks like, um, I also wanted to show this to you um, to highlight some of the things that you might do that might make it work better um, and mean that you, know, you do raise the finance. So if you are trying to raise $60,000 that you manage to do it. Um, unfortunately, you can't see our video. Um, I was going to play it for you, but we haven't, I mean, we haven't got sound, so I can't um, show it to you. But, um, you should watch this video. Um, it features our team being quite silly in our office. Oh, that's my email, sorry. How embarrassing. Um, so yeah, so you make a crowdfunding video that features you as the filmmaker, features the production team, and gives a potential set of donors something to connect with you. So you shouldn't have a trailer for your film without you in it. Um, because unfortunately, people who give to crowdfunding campaigns don't care about the subject, no, sorry, they don't care about you as a filmmaker, they don't care about films, what they care about are campaigns and feeling connected with you. So um, Catherine perfectly got it um, on the nose when she said that people didn't want to give to films about science because it made them feel like they were at school. What they want to do is give to the filmmakers. They want to feel part of a rolling campaign. So that's why we are in the video that I can't show you. Um, so that's really important. And then the other really important thing in your campaign are your perks, which are the things down here that are steadily getting, uh, getting bought up. Um, and um, so it's, it's a good idea to offer people quite... Um, like amazing experiences or amazing items that they wouldn't otherwise be able to get. So for example, um, I mean, no, no one's got this yet, so it's not, it doesn't seem like a good example, but um, we're offering people the chance to go on a fire walk with us um, because in no other, uh, there's no other way that you would be able to um, walk on hot coals with the Sheffield Docfest staff, unless you gave to this campaign. So that's why we're doing that. It's very early days, people will, people will take it up. So you need to offer things where they're completely unique experiences or unique items. So for example, um, we're offering limited edition signed records from um, a, uh, a musician in, from Sheffield who's very popular. And again, you can only get that through this campaign. So if you offer people things like that, then it's a one-off experience that means that Again, they feel really connected with you. It's actually not about, it's not about the objects. It's about the experience of feeling like they're very well connected with you. Um, and these are a few of the kind of principles of crowdfunding that I think you need to get straight before you do a campaign. And the really important one for me is that it's not just about getting the money. The money's great. The money is an excellent, an excellent side product. But it's more about building your audience and building a community around you so that when you finish the film, those are gonna be the people who will advocate for your film, that will help to distribute it, that will make people switch on the TV if it's on TV or download it if it's available online. Um, and that's really crucial that you build that community around you and not just for this film, but also for your future films. Those will be the people that will come with you to your next films. Um, and I really believe in this interactivity with your audience and thinking them as, of them as a community and of fans of your work. They're not your audience, they're not consumers, they, they're your fans, they're the people who are obsessed with you, who really want to follow you along. Um, so you need to know them. Um, and that's why I say it's not about begging. It's, um, it's not about demeaning yourself. Um, it's not a sign that you can't get funding from anywhere else. It's actually a very positive step that you have the confidence in um, in the people that you're interacting with who were formerly called the audience um, to engage with your work. Um, and if you have any doubts about um, whether, whether this is a demeaning relationship, then compare it to the general relationship that filmmakers have with commissioning editors, say. And lots, commissioning editors are lovely people, obviously, but there's a definite um, power 
um, non, there's a definite power dynamic there where there's in a, an inequality between the filmmaker and the commissioning editor. Um, and that's fine, and I'm not abandoning that as a system of funding, but definitely crowdfunding is a more equitable relationship. Um, and I've, I'm almost out of time, but I also wanted to um, show you a couple more things, which is some of the stuff you might crowdfund for, um, you know, beyond, beyond just saying, give us some money to make our film, which isn't really going to motivate people. Um, these are some of the things that you might say you're raising for. And so they're quite, you know, they're quite mundane things, like, you know, to get into the studio, to um, package up your work. But if you give people a very specific thing that they can invest in, um, then it motivates them. They, they can see what's going to come out down the line um, at the end of... Um, at the end of the process. Um, and I also just want to show you another example of a successful crowdfunding campaign um, to, show, to kind of show you why people might give to it. Um, this is actually not a documentary. Uh, the principle still holds, though. This is a, uh, a, uh, a musical uh, that, um, that's being made by Stuart Murdoch, who's the singer in a band called Bell and Sebastian, who some of you may have heard of. Uh, and he's decided to be a film director. Um, they, they went well beyond the $100,000. They raised like $130,000 in the end, so th this was just halfway through. Um, but they, they knew that people would give to this campaign because they were obsessed with Stuart Murdoch, they were big fans of the band, um, that they wanted to feel connected with him. And so the prizes that, or the perks that they gave people were things like um, getting to spend time in the editing studio with Stuart Murdoch, getting driven around Glasgow by Stuart Murdoch, getting to um, win the baton that he used to conduct the orchestra. Um, so it's basically you know, experiences where you get to be close to someone that you're obsessed with. That's the kind of level of fandom that you want to get to. And, the le and you know, Stuart Murdoch's a relatively famous person, but y you as a filmmaker or as a festival organiser, you can be that person where people are obsessed with you, and that's the kind of level of devotion that you want, um, that you may get from some commissioning editors, and you probably get that from Claire, I'm sure, but that's the kind of level of, um, you, you want that kind of obsession, and that, that's the kind of thing that you're really... Um, that's the kind of thing that you're really shooting for. And if you do that, then you may be successful. Um, and before I finish, um, I just want to say that there was a big development last week where Kickstarter, which is one of the two main um, crowdfunding platforms, this is Kickstarter here, um, they just launched that they're going to launch, they just announced that they're going to launch in the UK, um, which is a, a big thing because it means that they're taking money in pounds rather than dollars. Um, and obviously, you know, this, um, you know, I'm English, so that's very exciting. You can take money in pounds, but it actually means that it's open to the whole of Europe because the funding mechanism they're using um, means that anyone outside America can now use it, whereas before before, um, you literally couldn't take payments unless you had an American bank account. So, you know, this is really good. Um, Kickstarter has raised nearly $400 million since it launched, which um, is a lot of money, obviously. Um, so, um, yeah, so crowdfunding is good, and um, I could talk forever about it, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> Thank you, and we'll go over to Claire now. Thanks. Um, just one question, Charlie. Does, does that mean if you're European, you can contribute to a Kickstarter campaign that's happening in England? Um, well, you, you've always been able to contribute from anywhere in the world. But you have to, um, the money has to come from... The, no, the money could come from anywhere, but to be able to receive the money oh, for, as a Kickstarter oh, campaign, you had to have an American bank account. I see. But now you, so now now British, you don't. British producers can... Um, but, yeah, but anyone in the world, because it's now a non-geographically specific funding mechanism. Great, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just to, just to clarify that. So I'm Claire Aguilar. I'm Vice President of Programming at ITVS, which stands for the Independent Television Service. And we are a funder and presenter of, um, of um, films, mostly documentary, um, since um, for 21 years now. So um, I had a very interesting experience last week with, in which um, I started cleaning out files. Um, and you know, I'd been there at ITVS for 12 years, and I started cleaning out files. And about you know, everyone who passed me kept saying, "What? You still have paper files? What's wrong with you?" You know, but that was the point. I was I really wanted to purge all my paper files and really get to electronic. 
Um, but it's, it was an interesting experience because I came across some great documents and they were all kind of historic, very archi archival, one of which was a, an initiative that we launched in 1999 and we called it DV99 and it was at the advent of DV technology where we designed this initiative for producers who wanted to use DV cameras to make films. And we had a very, very precise set of principles, meaning that it would be inexpensive. For us, inexpensive meant that the ceiling was $75,000 for the production license, which in relationship to our production license was about a third of what we usually gave. Um, it would have to be made on DV and also edited like digitally on beta, digi beta or something, which at that time was like, woo, you know, really technological and that um, it would have to be, in terms of the content, very intimate and the kind of small stories that you wouldn't normally see on big splash broadcasting. So it was interesting looking at this initiative and then looking back to where we are now, 2012, and seeing that most of those principles had just kind of flown by. I mean, it was, you know, now production costs kind of more than ever, even though, you know, it, we assumed that DV technology would not, not only make production easier, but also post-production in terms of cost. And that really hasn't proven the case. Um, in terms of the DV technology for production, I mean, we've gone way beyond that. I mean, we don't, now we don't even accept DV footage for broadcast. It's something that we actually frown down upon. And also, um, in terms of those stories, though, um, that we, we got a really good slate of films from them, including, um, you know, films that we normally wouldn't get, like films from producer um, Stanley Nelson, who is a, is a history producer normally. He does a lot of big subject. He did The Murder of Emmett Till and um, Freedom Riders. He made a film with our DV initiative about his family home in Martha's Vineyard you know, just because he had that technology. So there were successes and failures, but I'll just say that, you know, when we kind of look, when we look to the future, it's kind of good to look at the past and see what you've accomplished. It's like looking at the strategic plan that you did five years ago, which we do, and either tick off all the things you've accomplished or else say, this was totally baloney or malarkey, as the word, the operative word is after our vice presidential debate, and say, we can start over again. And this is the time now where we have to start over and reinvent all the time, um, in, in, including the technological realm, but also in the content realm. So um, all to say that a lot of the issues that we've been facing in the United States in terms of ITVS, public media, and um, distribution of documentary, have we been able to um, follow a trajectory that's been a learning curve for one. Um, what we, if you don't know, how we normally work is that we offer a license fee in exchange for um, the uh, television rights for the United States, usually on public television in the United States. And um, this is exclusive. On the other hand, those uh, definition of what those rights are has expanded quite a lot so that now broad television includes a lot of online rights, as Catherine was saying, as well as the TV rights. But um, independent producers and filmmakers are, it's very difficult for them to carve out those rights because of the, um, the, uh, the, the control that broadcasters have over this package of rights. So right now, um, I think that the ideal is to be able to carve out those rights, meaning to separate your broadcast rights from your online rights, from your educational, theatrical, festival rights. But often, um, it's very difficult to do that because it's in the best interest sometimes to stay with either one broadcaster, one distributor, one sales agent. But on the other hand, what you can do is uh, open the world to a lot of possibilities. For example, um, the filmmaking uh, couple, um, Heidi Ewing and Rachel Grady, who um, made Jesus Camp, and they just came out with a film called Detropia, about Detroit. Um, it's a beautiful film. We financed part of it. We were the majority funder in it, ITBS. But what they decided to do was use a Kickstarter campaign for their distribution. And this was a little bit unheard of because Kickstarter campaigns have been used for production support or, you know, for Charlie, I mean, you're sort of at the vanguard now with Sheffield, you know, raising it for 
the film festival or your activities, but usually film producers are using it for production. And what Heidi and Rachel did is they said, we want to be independent, we want to raise it, I think they, want, they raised $50,000 to be able to launch our own distribution campaign, and they were very successful at doing that. And also they were able to share with their shareholders, their community, like what they were able to do, how they were able to share the film and talk about it, because um, it really catered to a lot of different people who were normally in the past the audiences and now we're part of this larger community that were interested in Detropia but also interested in helping them uh, support the film. So all to say that for us at ITVS, we're in a kind of a, it's a different place. So what we've tried to do is to help producers um, maintain the autonomy of those of, of having that content and, and the rights, we will take the television rights, but also try to help them to either carve out or distribute their film in many other ways. So for instance, we don't really give festival support, but if the film gets into Sundance or at South by Southwest, we'll be able to do some cross promotion for the film. And we'll also use social networking to give them a supplement of, um, maybe to do a, a short film that'll be the making of or an advertisement for the film. So when it eventually gets released, they can use that on Facebook or um, on any kind of platform where they're able to advertise the film. Um, we still need to have those, those, uh, those wide television rights though. And I think it's less contentious than it used to be three years ago, but it's still a, it's still a big problem. And also, as we've seen, the license fees for television have decreased a lot. And they've decreased with us, although we're very fortunate to be able to be funded the, for the majority by, um, by the American people through the, the Congress of the United States through an organization called the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And that has not decreased. But on the other hand, if you look at the landscape of documentary broadcasters and venues in the United States, there are not a lot of slots left for documentary. Um, there are a couple of things that emerge. For instance, CNN just announced they're going to be doing some original doc acquisitions and programming, and they're going to commission Alex Gibney on a new film and possibly other filmmakers on, I think there'll be four to six documentary features on CNN. But this is very rare. Uh, we saw the Oprah Winfrey network own go into something called the Docu Club, which was people had a lot of high hopes for to have documentary, showcase documentary program, and that was dissolved last year. Uh, the Sundance Channel doesn't really buy a lot of creative documentaries anymore, but you still have the venues like PBS, um, like um, Link TV, like the Documentary <laughs> Channel, and then some other, like the CNN deal that they have where you're able to see it. But it's very difficult to get the, the film shown. What's great about PBS, though, is that we're able to, we have at least three slots where we can show documentary, um, Independent Lens, POV, Frontline, which is an investigative strand, um, and also for American subjects and broadcasters, we have American Masters and American Experience. Um, and also we're able to show the film at uh, different lengths. So if you have a feature, it's a possibility to show it on PBS as a feature length, even at a two hour length in some cases. So that's an advantage. But the slots are limited. Um, Independent Lens has 22 slots, POV has 13, American Masters has eight, American Experience has about 10, but hardly any independent films get on that strand, so it's, it's quite limited. Um, what we've been doing lately is also trying to help producers in the realm of content creation for transmedia. And um, this is something that is a great uh, bridge for I think the independent producer and also what's happening for technology. So we've been trying to um, enhance the documentaries with different transmedia applications that come in the guise of either iPad applications, games, um, some enhanced web form or some mobile applications, um, one of which is a, a series of short films about food sustainability called The Lexicon of Sustainability by a producer named Douglas Gayton that is everything from a book to a tour to a photo exhibit 
and also an iPad app, which is what we funded. So we're trying to, he's a kind of a weird animal because he knows how to do all this stuff, but there are a lot of filmmakers that would say, all right, I have a documentary, I have an idea for an app, how do I go about doing that? And what we're trying to do is to um, help producers partner with either web developers or companies to be able to harness that technology to be able to realize that. Or maybe, maybe the producer doesn't have an idea and wants to work with a web developer or somebody technologically to say, well, how can I transfer my documentary into a transmedia application or go onto a, another kind of uh, platform, an online platform for some of the information in this film. Um, last year, we partnered with, um, with Mozilla. And I'm sure you know Mozilla. They're the, the, the creator of Firefox, which is the, the great browser. And Mozilla has a foundation as well as a for-profit, which is their Firefox company. But what they did is uh, we did a, um, a workshop with film producers to do um, different applications with them. And we called it a hackathon. And it was because they hacked it out. We had three days for them to basically um, sit with a web developer that Mozilla furnished. And we furnished the filmmakers. And they just said, let's just try to do anything from an app to a game. And it can be a prototype. But what happened is that uh, six pairs of producer web developer teams emerged. And everyone made either an application or game that was able to be launched um, in six months. So, um, and if you want to read about that, that's all online on our site, itvs.org, where we're going to continue to do that again. And Mozilla has also partnered with other organizations to do hackathons all over because they're really interested in the power of social documentary and social issue-based media. And they really want to be able to partner the, their technological savvy and the people that they work with with, with filmmakers. And they're very different worlds. So that's what we're kind of looking for in the future in terms of trying to um, at least enhance and make uh, really viable this new distribution platform for online distribution, whether it is going to be the dinosaur, you know, like me and my files and the traditional creative documentary that is still going to get a lot of eyeballs and a lot of audience. But on the other hand, we have a lot of a big world of possibilities now with these online platforms and how you can either derive content from your documentary to put on them or to create um, brand new um, fantastic work and content for them. So I'll stop there. And if you have questions, we can continue. Thank you. And we'll finish with Madeline from the Doc Corner. Bonsoir, euh, je vais faire une petite parenthèse dans la présentation puisque donc moi je représente, euh, je suis ici pour présenter le Doc Corner qui est le nouvel espace au sein du marché du film du Festival de Cannes dédié au documentaire. Donc nous on travaille, enfin on, on propose aux producteurs, aux vendeurs de documentaires, de longs métrages documentaires, une, une vitrine au sein du marché pour euh, pouvoir travailler et amorcer le travail de distribution en salle, notamment. Euh, donc cette année, on a eu la première édition de ce, cet espace euh, qui nous a permis de, de regrouper en fait, tous les films présentés au marché du film euh, dans une vidéothèque. Euh, voilà, donc c'était un premier essai. On a été satisfait de voir en fait qu'il y avait une, un intérêt de la part des professionnels présents au marché du film pour cet espace. Euh, nous allons donc poursuivre cette aventure l'année prochaine. Euh, et pour ça, enfin voilà, nous sommes en train de travailler à une nouvelle programmation pour euh, étoffer par rapport aux besoins euh, des, des producteurs et des vendeurs euh, spécialisés dans le documentaire. Voilà, c'est un petit peu flou. On est en train de tester, d'essayer des choses. Euh, cette année, donc, nous avons fait donc, la vidéothèque qui représentait euh, de, 230 films longs métrages documentaires réalisés dans l'année. Euh, il faut savoir que donc au marché du film, il y a 4000 films, donc ça fait un un, un petit pourcentage quand même, c'est quand même important. 
Et euh, voilà, donc nous avons aussi organisé des rencontres avec certains professionnels euh, qui étaient plutôt des experts pour amorcer le type de discussion qui est l'objet de, de cette rencontre et de cette table ronde. Donc du coup, voilà, je laisse la parole euh, à, à cette table ronde. Et euh, voilà, donc n'hésitez pas à me contacter. Euh, je reste là jusqu'à la fin du, de, du Medimed euh, pour répondre à des questions peut-être d'ordre plus pragmatique euh, sur le Doc Corner. Merci. Now, before we get to questions, I just want to say that you all have this questionnaire in your pack, and please can you fill it in and hand it out before you go. And now let's get to the most interesting part, because we really want to get as many comments and questions from you as we can. So who has the first question for us? Anyone? No? <laughs> oh. Okay, well, I'll just respond then to a couple of things because I started first. And the one thing I wanted to say from my experience is that the internet is a beast. And that can mean that you have to be really clear with what you're doing before you start engaging in any social media campaign because it's very hard to get things off the internet when they're on. So if you're not prepared to answer like 200 emails from irate people in Iran who have taken offense, then have a, think twice before you put your film online. At the moment, one of the films that we're working on, we're working on the online and outreach strategy. And I had a very interesting meeting with the director and we were talking about exactly these issues because we want there to be a very strong social campaign, an outreach campaign. Because I think one of the things that no one has mentioned is you can use these new platforms to reach an audience and to gain money, but you can also reach, use these new platforms to try and change things a bit more. And films like Never... Claire, you can help me. Your film about the Philippines, Never... Ne, give up tomorrow, give up tomorrow. Really change things. And they change things because they had a great outreach campaign. And that's what we're trying to do with one of our films now, which is again about a miscarriage of justice. But the director was complaining to me that he didn't have the time to answer lots of questions from people because he knows that it's still a very controversial case. And so he was saying to me that he doesn't even want to start thinking about the outreach campaign until the premiere has done, he's had, the film is finished, we've had the first couple of screenings, and then we'll have time to answer questions. So I think he's made the right decision not to start the campaign too early because if you start things too early, you'll burn yourself. The other bad experience that my company had, again to do with online, is although sites say that they're safe and they're geo-blocked, if someone wants to hack a film, they will. So in, my, in our particular case, we had a very sensitive film that couldn't be seen in some countries because it contained some interviews. And we had a broadcast deal that was dependent on the broadcaster having the online VOD rights. And we were told that these rights was, that this site was secure. And of course, someone really wanted to see this film. So the film ended up being hacked from the broadcaster's site and going to exactly the country where it shouldn't have been seen in. And we had a nightmare scenario where people received death threats. Now that's a very, very extreme case. But for example, if you haven't cleared certain rights for certain countries, then be very careful before you put it on the internet. Don't think that I can geo-block it to the countries that I've got the rights for, because especially if it's a film about a very sensitive issue and people want to see it, they'll generally find a way of getting it. And now hopefully someone has some questions for us. No? It's a question for Charles Philippe. Uh, I have a, a documentary and I, I would like to finance in, with your system. Uh, I have a, a very clear audience. The target for me is very clear and I can control it. Huh? So I think that it's good, but how to start? 
how can I start? Because uh, it's very new for me, because usually I finance my documentaries through TV, through other producers. It's my first time. Uh, um, I think you just have to do it, really. I mean, it's, 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 free to, it's free to crowdfund, obviously, so you just set up an account and you just set up the campaign. Um, but having said that, you do need to try and do as much preparation in advance as possible to make sure that you know who you're going to market the campaign to and who your target givers are. So whatever the subject of the film is, you know, literally make a list of the kind of people you think would donate to a film about that subject and then have a look at all of the you know, charities, community groups, um, groups of people that vaguely fit in with the subject of your film. Um, make a list of all the people who um, you've ever helped in your life, not, ju not just film, but like your family, your friends, you know, someone who you did a good deed for five years ago. Just make a list of anyone who potentially would want to help you for, for whatever reason. And then when you be ready, when you launch the campaign, to just you know, write to each of those people individually and say, you know, I'm doing this, this film is gonna be something you would really want to see, so just you know, give a small amount of money. So it's the kind of preparation for, the, for knowing who you're going to target. Can I say something? I mean, one thing that's really great about Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and I think you have access to Indiegogo, to, is seeing the way that people are pitching their projects. They have come up with pitch tapes, which are a little bit like the, the Indian space project there, where the director shows up and basically introduces the project, and it can be either humorous or dead serious, but in a really creative way. And you can have access to seeing how people do that to craft your own kind of pitch tape. So, you know, it's true you have to dive in and do it, but it's very educational. And you might end up contributing to somebody's Indiegogo campaign just because it's so persuasive. It's, you know, I think they're really at a very high level now. Thank you. Because you talk about Indiegogo, it was the model we, we saw on the screen. Uh, is it the reference? platform crowdfunding in France we have Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and they, they are very very good for crowdfunding doc documentaries they, they do a lot so is there some already references about uh, platforms crowdfunding that's my question so um, yeah I think I understand the question um, it, in a way, it doesn't really matter what platform you use because the, the major way that you'll raise money is by how good your outreach strategy is. And so whether you're directing people to Kiss Kiss Bang Bang or Indiegogo or to your own website kind of doesn't matter. Um, but the advantage of Indiegogo and Kickstarter is that they have massive communities from all over the world using them. So they have more... They have more users, so there's a slightly higher chance of people stumbling across it. Uh, but it doesn't... Oh, they, um, yeah, well, it, d it depends how far you go back to define when crowdfunding started. But in terms, in terms of the new wave of platforms that offer that opportunity, Indiegogo did start just before Kickstarter. Um, but Kickstarter has arguably done it slightly better. Um, but you're, you're ad I mean, it's, I'm glad that you brought up Kiss Kiss Bang Bang because there are different platforms for different territories that, you know, shock horror aren't English speaking. So um, that, if you're French, then yes, maybe it is better to, you know, to, to use that because people might like to be able to give in euros and might like being on a platform that's in their native language. So it depends who you're appealing to. So I have a question for the people in the audience. Uh, you've spent uh, two full days now at MediMed, and you've been to pitching forums and lectures and workshops. Uh, I'm wondering if you could tell us what's the most important thing you've learned while you were here. If you've had any new re realizations, uh, new things that have cropped up for you because of your contacts and interactions either with us, the experts, commissioning editors, or your peers. I would love to hear the kinds of things that have been floating around in, in your universe. Can 
Can I, um, while, while we're waiting, can I just respond to something that Catherine said there? Yeah, do, yeah, it is, it is really hard. Just, I mean, just quickly to respond to something you said there. Um, in the case of the film where you didn't want it to get out into a certain territory and they received death threats, like clearly you do need to be exceptionally careful there. But I think that, you know, we have to be realistic that if there's a demand for people to see, um, to see a film and they can't find a legal way of watching it online in their country, then they are obviously going to find an elite. So people doing that is a response to not being, to their demand not being satisfied. And I don't think you can fight against that, even though that completely messes up your business model. And as we were oh, saying... The that, internet <laughs> messes up my business model. Yeah. So. I mean, the internet is a big challenge, and so... You know, we need to find ways that that person who is downloading the film in that country can be offered a legal way to do it, mm -hmm. um, rather than saying, "Well, you know, someone doesn't have someone in that territory doesn't have the rights to that film, so that's it." You know, you can't, you just can't see that film now, even though you really want to. You know, it's a problem. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> one of the new challenges of distribution that there are all these conflicting rights. And to be honest, no one really knows how they work together. We have broadcasters requesting rights that they don't need for platforms that they don't have on the off chance that in five years' time they might find a use for them. At the same time, we have other people, other platforms desperate for rights without any kind of money up front. And we have people wanting you to spend days filling out five or six spread spreadsheets on the off chance that in six months' time you might get a five euro royalty. So for us, the... The best model, well, the most lucrative models, the, we make most of our money still from the old people, from the broadcasters, from the film funds. It's just that now there are more opportunities and more potential. And I think that if you have a film that's very good and that speaks to a very specific audience and you're focused, you can speak to that audience directly now. So just to give you one example, we had a film about people adopting babies from China. And that went on some kind of newsletter of mothers that had these children from China. And we were inundated with requests for DVDs. And that's something, a film that we'd tried to sell before into those countries. And the broadcasters always said, no, we want like nationals from our country adopting babies from China. Or we've just done a film about babies from India, so we're not interested in babies from China. And all, but together, all those parents that had children from China, and we're talking about several thousand DVD requests in just a week. Uh, well, in this particular film, they were from Sweden. So because the film was subtitled, a lot of like Anglo-speaking countries didn't want to take a subtitled film. Yes, well, it's not a question. It's about uh, a response about Murray, who's uh, asking us what uh, in those days with, uh, it's in our heads, you know? And I think it's in the, in the way that Catherine was telling that in, it's a moment where um, some, you, we have to focus on, on the audience more than in broadcasters. They were, uh, before, the, in, in, in intermediaries, I don't know how to say it in English, but, you know, the people who were in between, you, you as a producer and, and the audience. And now, uh, with this uh, now, um, ways to find uh, funds, you, are, uh, all, you have to, to know the, the, the audience, you have to, to know what they want, what they, when they want to hear and what they are able to, to, to be passionate. So I think it's a, it's a nice moment also, it's not, uh, not, not, it's not bad, it's different, but well, I think it's... Well, I want to ask uh, Claire a question, and that's, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the lexicon of sustainability, and I wonder if you have other examples of uh, documentaries that were able to cross into other media successfully and really make powerful use of uh, either applications or, yeah. Yeah, we have several right now. Um, we're, um, let me see. We're doing, we're doing, well, one is finished. I'll talk about that. There was a documentary that we financed called More Than a Month. And in the United States, we have these commemorative months for different ethnicities 
It's only in the United States we have this. So February is Black History Month. It's traditionally been the month where we commemorate, like on television, black programming, and there's a lot of, but there's a lot of controversy about it. So the, the, um, the documentary is, is like, why February? Should we have a month to commemorate black history programming or not? And um, the filmmaker's a young African-American guy, and he kind of goes on a little road trip and talks to people about it. So he wanted to do um, an iPhone app um, that actually did celebrate black history. So he came up with an iP iPhone app called More Than a Map, like more than a month, more than a map, with two Ps. And this was a, a mapping um, iPhone device that basically um, mapped out different African American locales and either you know churches, graveyards, sites of the Underground Railway, and this was also user contributed. So he so he set up like a template of about 250 sites all over the United States, and then users could contribute to. Oh, this is the site where you know. Um, a, part of the Underground Railroad, or here's an African American museum in Alaska or in Mississippi. And so he's had about um, 200 contributions to that map right now. And it's a free app, and you can get it. And it's just a way of sort of navigating different locales like that. And that was a very simple um, and very inexpensive app to create. But then we're doing another other things that are a little more expensive that, you know, for instance, we're doing one that is a, um, it's basically an iPad app that's based on a um, animated comic. So I mean, uh, on a on a like a paper comic. So it's going to be an animated iPad app. That, so that's a little bit more expensive. So stuff like that. But it's very exciting. It's it's kind of cool. I mean, I think one of the things I was thinking about. I, I don't know when you were speaking, but or when when Catherine was speaking about how, you know, how do you time out? You know, when you can fit in how to do these extra activities when you're just trying to concentrate on the film. And do you get distracted with trying to complete the film? And then you think, well, I really want to do a transmedia application too. But I remember like 10 years ago when people would say, um, well, you know, you have to create a website for your film, you know, but then producers would say, well, I don't know how to do that. I mean, um, but then they, they really found a way to do that very quickly. It wasn't that difficult. And it wasn't that they Sheffield, you have different things that happen at IDFA. You have things happening that we're doing. You have Power to the Pixel that's happening next month. Um, and it's possible, but we're still at that kind of wave where, you know, it seems impossible, but it's doable. Yeah, I mean, if I can just add to that, you, you get someone to do it for you. Um, because if you're the producer, you wouldn't necessarily also be directing and editing and sound recording and everything. And so the building of the app is just another role on the, on the production. But you're right that people don't really know who to go to to get to help them to build the app. But one so. thing I wanted just to say is that with all these new opportunities, I think a lot of people are becoming overwhelmed and thinking that to make a film, you have to have a website and you have to have an app and you have to have a media consultant and you have to have a festival strategy. You don't. You just have to know who your audience is and how to reach them. And it could be that your audience is a TV audience and you're best off just making the best 52-minute doc that you can and forgetting about the festival version and forgetting about the website and all that stuff. Or it could be that you want a strong social message behind your film and you really do need all that other stuff. But don't make an app because that film had an app and you think you need it. Make an app if there's a reason for making it. Hello. Uh, I would like to know, uh, when is it the right time to start the campaign during all the process? The, the crowdfunding campaign? <coughs> do, you, do you mean a crowdfunding campaign? A crowdfunding campaign. Um, it, depends, it depends when you need the money. Uh, if you need the money very early to literally kick start you, that's why it's called it, then at the start. But if you, if you need money to edit it or you need money for your distribution, then it really, de I mean, it depends what you need the money for. That's the simple answer. Well, but I think uh, you're ready when you're actually ready. You can do it any time in the project, but you could be, be, be at post-production and might not be ready for crowdfunding. So to be ready for crowdfunding, A, you have to have a crowd. 
you have to have access to, to people in a crowd. And B, you have to be ready to really articulate passionately and lucidly uh, your project and what you want the money for. Uh, and C, I think to be successful at crowdfunding, you must have a team around you. I just can't imagine doing a 30 to 60 day crowdfunding campaign without a lot of help because it's, it's really 24 seven. It just stops your life while you're doing it. Um, and uh, I don't know if I'm an A, B, C, or D, but one other thing you need is you need access to a really uh, interesting perks, the things that you're gonna give away. Um, and uh, D, you need to understand how to do crowdfunding. I mean, it's been around enough now so that there is a science to it and there's a way to do it well and there's a way not to do it well. I was really shocked just before I came here. Uh, Evie and I live in, in Napa, California. Uh, and uh, just by accident, I found out that someone we knew was doing a crowdfunding campaign for their organization. So I jumped on, and this is a really intelligent guy, and I won't mention the name of the organization. So I jumped onto the Kickstarter page, and it's an absolute disaster. The, you know, there's just no way this person is gonna raise money. There's like a 10 minute video of him directly talking to the audience about why he wants the money for the organization, right? And the only thing he's giving away is like free tickets to the festival. <laughs> There's just no way in the world that in the next 30 days he's gonna raise that money. Even though the cause is great, and if I had consulted with him two months ago, he could have put together a really you know, dynamite campaign. He wasn't ready for it. Um, so that's my quick answer to, to your question. Hi, I'm, I'm not really used to being the sort of conservative voice in a room, but I want to say just a little word for the broadcaster. So as I'm being conservative, a couple of cliches. So um, don't run before you can walk and don't bite the hand that feeds you. Now let me try and put that into perspective a little. Um, in the thousands of hours I come across every year as a buyer, so far I've seen one program which had some Hulu finance in it and one which had some Netflix finance in it. All the rest were financed the traditional way. So it's wonderfully positive that all these things are happening and they are happening and they're gonna grow and everyone's gonna make more and more use of them. But in your haste to make this happen, please don't forget the broadcaster. Okay, some of you who have be knocking on broadcasters' doors and never get an answer, probably saying, what are you talking about? So, you know, I know obviously broadcasting doesn't reach everything. But what I think is important in this context is that to remember that the bread and butter is still the broadcasters, or at least they're involved. And in this new world, we need rights. We need the free video on demand. We need the catch-up. We need to be able to put it on a mobile phone. So, please, in your... in enthusiasm and I wish you every luck and getting all the platforms together and all the rest of it, make sure you don't lose the ability of giving us those rights that we need. Support us. Without your support, we could disappear. And in which case, there's going to be a huge gap because right now, nobody is filling the broadcaster's shoes. That may happen, but it ain't happening yet. So make sure you can, you have those rights available because if you offer me a program, you say, I can't give you catch up. I won't buy it. And I, I've had answers like, I've had people tell me, yeah, you can have the catch up for PCs, but it's not for smart TVs. It's like, get out of here. It's got to get to everyone who it can possibly reach. Do not start talking to me about what device it's on. I want it out there and I want it on every device that has ever existed and will ever exist. And that's the only way of keeping broadcast television going, and particularly I'm coming from public television, which I hope everyone here agrees is in need of support nowadays. So please don't forget us, for your own good too. I just want to agree with that completely because as a distributor, we have, we've had lots of deals before that have either been ruined or nearly been ruined because the channel, the, the commissioner, not the commissioner, the producer has given away rights or wasn't prepared to let films go online at all, at all, at all. And especially for broadcasters now, most, I mean, TV viewing figures are going down. 
So it's the online figures that they're looking at more and more. So if you can't give them the online rights because you've given them to someone else or because you want to hold them back for a reason, then do be prepared to lose some broadcast deals. I have a double question for the enthusiastic side of the table. Um, um, we've run a crowdfunding campaign. In fact, it, it has been successful, very successful, because we made a record, but we ran a hell of it, you know. Um, it, it's been really difficult because we try to do lots of things that we know that it's not right to do. Um, we started the campaign really early. Uh, we started to ask f people for help. Just, uh, hey, hello, we need help. Not like, hello, we have a movie, and no. Hello, we need help. Um, we didn't have a trailer. Um, uh, we didn't have confirmed actors. Uh, we had a story and a great team, and that's all. Uh, it was midsummer. It's like everything against us, and even we ask for money for um, pe some people getting paid. That it's like a taboo, and uh, we have the sensation that, as Morley he said, crowdfunding campaigns only can cover um, non-professional expenses, but uh, because um, if you talk about salaries. People say, oh, you are uh, creators. Why do you want salaries? More or less, you know, it's not like this, but more or less. Um, if the most valuable um, pro production value is the people involved in it, and there's not great material expenses, um, how can we explain that we need the money so we can pay your rent and make a great movie for them. Um, I don't. I don't think it is as much of a taboo as you think to try and raise. I don't think it is a taboo to say that you're raising money so that the filmmakers can live. I think that's okay. Um, but I do take your point that generally crowdfunding campaigns don't cover the entire budget for the film for its entire lifespan. Um, but they don't cover that at the moment. That doesn't mean that they, like the amount, the average amount raised in a crowdfunding campaign is rising by the day. So we may eventually get to a place where it does cover um, substantial portions of a budget. That said, to link in with the previous question, um, we're, we're, we're in a point now where your ideal thing is that you raise some money from crowdfunding, you raise some money from broadcasters, you raise some from film funds or wherever else. Um, but that's because we're in a transitional time. You know, I am really enthusiastic about this, but I don't claim that you know, overnight crowdfunding became the single way for everyone to make a living. And one thing I'll just say is that in this panel, we've talked a lot about crowdfunding platforms and traditional broadcasters. But there are other ways of funding dogs. And think about what you need the money for and if you can just get that thing directly. So, for example, if you want to raise a certain amount of, of money to buy flights to go and film, then maybe you can get some kind of sponsorship or get someone to donate their air miles. Maybe people can donate something other than money. And generally, the Americans are much better at doing this than us. And there is a delicate line to walk, because if your film has too much product placement in it, no public, broad, uh, no public broadcaster will touch it. But at the same time, I think sponsorship and donations of things other than money are another way that filmmakers can get their film made, and that that's something that not really many people are doing at the moment. Well, um, my theory is let a thousand flowers bloom. So... <laughs> You go wherever and whenever you can, but there are many, many ways to raise the money. Uh, and how you do it is highly dependent both on your skills, your capabilities, your energy, your resources, and also the nature of the project itself, because some doors are closed by some projects, and some projects open up other doors. Um, so I don't think any of us think that right now crowdfunding is the answer. It isn't for any of my clients, but it is part of an answer. 
So that's one thing I'll say. And I could list like 30 or 40 different ways to raise money, but I wanted to address your point about the filmmaker getting paid. And that is, I think it's really dangerous that the filmmaker adopts an attitude that, that they shouldn't be paid, or that they're the artiste and they should be doing it for love. That's really dangerous. And it's why when I'm working with a client and they show me a budget, and then where the line item is the filmmaker zero, gets paid zero euros, I mean, I look at the filmmaker and say right away, it doesn't work for many reasons. Why? Well, you can't live for zero euros, right? And B, when the donor sees that you're not paying yourself, at least in America, they don't like that. They're curious about that. They wonder how you are going to make a living without it. And also, in America, if you give yourself zero, you're considered to be worth zero. So you have to respect your own work and what you're worth and give yourself equal value for it. And at least in the crowdfunding campaigns that I've looked at where the filmmakers paying themselves, it hasn't been a problem, as long as it was fair composition. I'm not real familiar with European crowdfunding, so I can't answer. I mean, I just, I just want to echo that. I do think that we need to, we need to be more American. We need to be better as Europeans about asking for money and not being ashamed of that. Any more questions? Okay, well, just before we finish, I just want to remind you all to fill in your questionnaires, and then let's go have cocktails. <laughs>